Okay, I'm um, all the people here. Yeah. Oh, shoot. I screwed up. Hold on, wait. So you guys can take out your wrath on them. <laughs> What's that? I've been on that before. Oh, yeah. No, I... It's usually um, us that runs late. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. That's fine. Because I said, look at the live stream. Yeah. And Sometimes said, okay. the audio gets wonky and I've never... Yeah. It's the computer. Yeah, yeah, that's the Chromebook. Or not the Chromebook, the Surface. Yeah. I figured the audio has to be better on that than it is on my iPhone, so. It's one of thousands of I know, I know. Yeah. 
I think we're gonna go, guys. Otherwise, we're just gonna be here. tell you that Christensen was arrested on April 30th, uh, which is Friday, over in Omaha. Um, he waived extradition on Tuesday when he appeared in court in Douglas County. Um, he was transported to Pottawatomie County yesterday afternoon, and he had his initial appearance this morning. Um, he is being charged with murder in the first degree. Um, he is being held on a $1 million cash in the bond, um, and his preliminary hearing date has been set for May 14th. I'm required to let you know that a charge is merely an accusation and he is presumed innocent unless and until we're proven guilty. Um, with me today are uh, Colorado County Sheriff Chief Deputy Jeff Poulin, uh, Sheriff's Investigator Jim Doty, and uh, Crime Scene Evidence Technician in the Sheriff's Office, Kathy Nicolet. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to Chief Deputy Poulin um, to do this well. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Um, I'm here this morning, frankly, because the sheriff has another commitment. He very much wanted to be here, but had something else going on this morning. But I, on behalf of him, first of all, I want to thank the team that, that did this case. Um, very diligent police work. It also shows that we don't surrender on any victim at any time. Um, August 14, 1983, had to be an unthinkable night. For Thursday, day and four. Sheriff Brown had looked at these cold cases in January. In fact, I and Hadley had met even before my first day on the job uh, and had talked about some of the cases that were involved in the county. This really goes back to how do you define justice? And when I taught at the college level, it was always difficult to tell students, you know, what is the definition of justice? And what I think's happened this morning is we are trying to define justice for Pharisee. And that definition will continue long after we're finished here. It will continue as County Attorney Wilbur takes his case to a ultimately finer fact, and we find out exactly what the criminal justice system does with the case. I personally, today, on behalf of Sheriff Brown, want to thank County Attorney Matt Wilbur He's been instrumental in guiding us through this case. Also, crime scene technician Hadley Mikovic and Sergeant Jim Doty and his team of investigators who never gave up on this girl and, and did Herculean work to make sure this case came to fruition. Uh, the Omaha Police Department's homicide unit assisted us as well as the Division of Criminal Investigation crime scientists that we used to help. Just to conclude my portion and really let the people that did the work here talk. Uh, we did initially, when this case was uh, discovered, find it very difficult to contact the family. Obviously, uh, Perez was Iranian. Her family lived, as we had heard, in Tehran, and then we had some relatives across Europe. There's obviously no embassy or consulate of the Iranian government in the United States. 
But we were very successful in contacting the Office of Special Interests of Iran that resides in Pakistan, the embassy in Washington, D.C., and they were extremely helpful to us in trying to identify relatives and people that were related to Farazad. Also, Sergeant Doe was able to reach out to the Metropolitan Police Department of London. They provided us a contact with Farazad's brother, and he has been notified of uh, the disposition of this case, and he is also speaking to her siblings that are still alive. We understand that Farazad's father is elderly, living in Tehran, and the Iranian government is going to take care of the contacts in that. Finally, I just want to talk about the professionalism of a couple of people behind him. Sergeant Doty, Frank C. Technician, Megabit, and all the members of the Sheriff's Office that again never gave up on this young girl. And so hopefully we are starting to define justice for her this morning. And I'll turn it over to Sergeant Doty. In August of 1983, Barroza's body was found in Pottawamie County. Investigators soon discovered that she had been reported missing from the UNO campus in Omaha. Over the next several months, several agencies worked together to try to find Barroza's killer. Unfortunately, the case went cold. However, the evidence that was collected in 1983 had been stored and preserved at the Sheriff's Office in case new information ever came to light. In the fall of 2020, a friend of Barroza's called the Investigations Division with information on the case. Uh, the caller had a name he wanted us to look into, and just like we do with every lead, we start to follow up on that new information. While reviewing the reports that the initial investigators wrote, uh, we ruled out the individual the caller suspected uh, being involved in Feroza's murder, because he had a solid alibi that evening. But while reviewing the case reports, we did find evidence that had been collected at the scene that could possibly benefit from DNA analysis. Uh, we sent several of these items to the laboratory, the Iowa DCI laboratory for DNA testing. In March of this year, we received a DNA hit on Bud Leroy Christensen. Uh, then we then focused our investigation on Christensen, and without getting into too many details, we were able to develop more evidence that linked Christensen to her murder. Uh, arrest warrants were issued, and he was arrested on Friday in Omaha with the assistance of the U.S. Marshals. Uh, she was an Iranian citizen and was in the U.S. to study at the university, so locating her family was difficult. But her brother was contacted on Tuesday and informed of the arrest. Uh, I'd like to thank the Omaha Police Department's Homicide Division for their assistance and the Iowa DCI Laboratory for their help on this case. Uh, physical evidence played a significant role. I wanted to recognize our crime scene technician, Kathy Nikovic, for her hard work on this case and give her a chance to say a few words. Since 1983, many advancements have been made in the field of forensic science. Due to these advancements, our agency was able to take evidence collected 38 years ago and send it to the Iowa DCI Crime, Lab Crime Laboratory back in November of 2020 for retesting. Those results allowed us more insight and eventually answers regarding this homicide investigation. Answers that Sergeant Doty and I agree Rosen's loved ones deserve. I would like to thank the Iowa DCI Crime Laboratory criminalists involved for their perseverance and hard work, as well as the OPD Forensic Division for their assistance. I would like to thank the Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office Administration for their support, and especially Sergeant Doty for his dedication and determination in, seeming, in making sure that justice was served for Grove. Finally, I would like to encourage the family and friends of homicide victims to never give up hope and to continue to work diligently with law enforcement agencies handling their investigation. Let Rose's case be an example that it is never too late to seek justice. Thank you. We're going to open up for a few questions. Again, I'm going to be pretty limited, I think, on what I can uh, talk about uh, factually, uh, what the um, sheriff's investigators uh, talk about. But before I do that, I want to um, sort of reach out to the public with a request for assistance. Obviously, this case is 38 years old. Um, anyone that has any information uh, about Thursday, uh, 
disappearance of the evening uh, that, uh, that she went missing, um, about any conversations that, that anyone may have had with Doug Christensen over the past 38 years, is encouraged to contact the Sheriff's Office and specifically ask for Sergeant Doty. Um, the uh, investigations number is 712-890-2224. If a person happens to be concerned, at least initially, about anonymity, they're always welcome to contact Crime Stoppers, which is 712-328-STOP or 712-328-7867. Uh, um, this is not a case um, that we will stop investigating until we're taking it to trial. So, you know, we've been working on it um, off and on for the over the past four decades, or four decades. Um, this is certainly a case that we will continue to look for leads and we will take those seriously. So anyone that has any information, whether it's just about Thursday's life at the time um, or um, uh, any uh, contact that she may have had with Mr. Christensen or again, any conversations that he may have had um, you know, during the past 38 years, we would greatly appreciate that information. And I'll turn it over to you. You said, um, I know that you're limited on the facts that you can share, but i um, curious about, you said that in 2020 you had a call that come in and asked to be investigated. Is there anything else that you can share about that? Who the caller was? What leads to Doug Christians and things like that? Uh, the caller was just a friend of hers. Uh, the name he gave us that he wanted to look into was not Bud Christensen. It was somebody else that the original investigators ruled out very quickly in their investigation because he had a solid alibi. Right? But sorry to follow up on that. That led you to the DNA that, that you found. That 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 led to that led to Mr. Christensen. So, is there a possibility that maybe there's other cold cases that has where technology has has caught up that, that maybe there's there's DNA that can that can maybe close close up? I, I know you can't probably divulge as far as where the DNA was found or what, what was the what the DNA you know and, and stuff like that. But is there could there possibly be um, you know, still cold cases there that, that, that could be re-examined using, using 21st century technology. We're always looking into our cases and reopening them and analyzing them to see if new technology can help us solve them. Uh, so in your affidavit, you talk about all of the items that um, were found near um, her. Uh, is there a connection that they were like, they knew each other, they were like, hanging out prior to her murder? Um, is there any connection that way? Uh, there's no connection that they were acquainted before she went to see that we found so far. I kind of want to follow up on what was asked earlier. Maybe Hadley uh, would love to hear your perspective. Um, should, I mean, really should cold cases that are years ago, should DNA that hasn't been entered ever before be, be re-entered now just to see if there's a hit on someone who's already in the database? Um, is, is, is that, should that be a priority for, you know, locally or nationwide for the department? You can answer. I would always encourage all law enforcement agencies to reconsider the physical evidence that they have in their cold case homicides and sexual assaults. Um, DNA has advanced significantly over the past 40 years. I can't even begin to describe it. Um, the things that a crime lab is able to do now, I would always encourage law enforcement officers to work with their state and local crime labs to uh, kind of review their evidence and see what might be available in order to assist in these cold case homicides. And I can assure you that Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office Investigations Division is committed to that as well. And I can just tell you also my conversations with uh, not just the Sheriff's Office, but also the Council of Police Department. I know that they are actively reviewing cold cases as we speak. You know, back in about, it was about 1985 or 86 when we first started um, seeing DNA testing. Um, and touch DNA even, you know, wasn't even a thing back then. Um, and so, um, you know, I would agree with that. As far as the, the advancements in technology and ability um, uh, to, uh, to test the DNA, and honestly, the, the robustness of DNA evidence and how it is still capable of being actively tested decades later um, really gives us a pretty good tool um, to take a look at. That said, we get, uh, you know, frequently bags and boxes full of evidence on, uh, on these cases. 
um, and trying to decide what um, you know, items may or may not have evidentiary value can be a challenge, uh, I think, just from a policy perspective. And so um, you know, we also know we basically have one crime lab in the state. Um, I know a challenge I always have is trying to get DNA test results back um, in a timely fashion because they've got 99 counties submitting um, evidence to them. Um, you know, cold cases give us a little bit more leeway because um, you know, we're not in maybe a big rush to get the tests in as opposed to cases we've already charged where we've got speedy trial issues uh, that we make sure that we, uh, that we handle. Um, but you know, we're also cognizant that we can't just send in 100 items um, you know, for testing on every case. Um, we would, we'd shut down the lab. Um, and so it's a, it's a tough balancing act uh, between, uh, you know, between doing this. Um, in this case, it just happened to be, I and mean, I think the, the sheriff's office is looking at this case found some, a couple of really good pieces of evidence um, that, uh, that looked like they may have uh, some value that um, turned out to be good. Is it common to hold on to pieces of evidence for this long? I mean, this is almost four years later. I don't know if that's kind of a silly question, but how long do you guys hold on to evidence in cases like these? Most statutes of limitations, federally and state, require us to keep homicide evidence for at least 99 years. The reason for this is usually because any offender will probably be deceased after that period of time and would no longer be able to be tried. But it is our policy at the Sheriff's Office that we keep homicide evidence for 99 years. Oh, we, yeah, I said, we still have murder files for cases even that were tried in our office. We have a separate lock room, and the, uh, the files go back decades um, in all of those cases, really until everyone involved in the case is deceased. Um, and we try to keep, uh, you know, keep those files. So, uh, but was in the system, and that's how you guys were able to look at the DNA. So, what were his um, convictions then? Yeah. We're really not allowed to talk about that. I mean, I'm sure there's things you can find in public records, but uh, I know in a job like mine, that's a big no-no uh, to talk about criminal records uh, publicly. Um, obviously, we want uh, Mr. Christensen to get a fair trial um, in this case, and uh, I'm going to do my best to make sure that happens and we're able to keep it in public. But when he was arrested, he was in the Dutch County Jail. I don't believe that's the case. He was, he oh, he was not in the Dutch County Jail? Oh, okay. He was he over in Douglas County? He was located in Douglas County. He was located in Douglas County. Okay, all right. So what will be the means for which it's moved to Omaha? Pardon? What will be the means in which this case will be moved to Omaha? All right, Douglas County. We wouldn't go to Douglas County, but we could get a change of venue due to pretrial publicity, and I could end up trying this case in Kasuth County, Iowa, or uh, you know, Fort Madison, or someplace like that that doesn't have the uh, the uh, you know the same uh, the press on it. So the you know the concerns for all of us is, is that both sides, the state and Mr. Christensen, get the fair trial um, that's based on the evidence that we put into uh, the case and not based on things that they may see um, you know outside. You know, for things like criminal records would never be able to be introduced in a trial. Um, you know, um, and so I can't talk about it because that's going to just have the potential of prejudice. If you can say, can you talk about the facts of the case that were kind of speculative years ago? Um, was she kidnapped or abducted from UNO campus and then you clearly believe that the murder happened here and that's where she was found? Or was she sexually assaulted or do you know any more details? Yeah. I know some of those details, but they're not ones that I think I'm comfortable with. Um, and obviously, I don't know what she can share with us. Is there any reason to call her leads? Um, what happened 40, almost 40 years ago in Sioux Flood, if that makes sense, like why she, did she hear anything or did she have? The call did not. Right? The call had no name. It was, it was the, uh, the testing that, that brought his name up. The call oh, okay. had a totally different name okay. that they thought may have been involved and it's just a person that had cleared back. Oh, okay. The so the caller basically called and was asking for you for the case and Correct. didn't think it was him. Correct. And it was while you were looking through the evidence, he, he came across this evidence and said, hey, maybe we should send this off for testing and, and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. I think that's correct. Yes. Yes. Hey, Chief Jeffy, quick question for you, because you were with Council of TV at the time. Can you kind of paint a picture as far as uh, back then for, 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 for those of us, especially, you know, that were 10 years old and, and maybe not even like, of what, <laughs> of, what it was, of what it was like here in Council Bluffs when, when, that, when that homicide No, happened. it was, uh, the reason I was aware of it is because at the time, uh, the Sheriff's Office and Huntsville's Police shared the building over at the courthouse, so there was a lot of cross-pollination going on all the time between the two departments. And I just remember when she was found, there was a lot of speculation, and if you, um, 
look at some of the cases and some of the original investigators, there was a lot of focus on the Iranian community in Omaha. And if you recall, it was just shortly after the Shah was overthrown in Iran. So there were some of those kinds of issues that were thought through by the investigators. Obviously, as we know now, uh, that did not pan out that way. The other thing I wanted to say just quickly is, think about the evolution of evidence as far as this case is concerned. With the original evidence that was discovered back in 1983, you would not have had the ability to do this. And so one of the reasons these cases, and, and there are many of them all over the country, are coming to light now is because evidence now is different and can be analyzed differently because of DNA and other types of advancements in forensics. So that's the reason this case and is is active today and that's why we're in front of you today is because technology changed. And everything is <laughs> So okay. this is really to hope that this is really to help them to 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 future to to, to other cold cases. Yeah, yeah we're, and and to say that the case was closed or open, this case was always open, and so we are constantly looking at different cases and more cases in the go. Hey, um, are you guys investigating this as a hate crime? And can you specifically explain why you are or not? Uh, we have no evidence, and again, as County Attorney has said, I really don't want to go down a lot of roads with anything. Because uh, Mr. Grissom is a respected guy. Okay, and then are there, is there any possibility that there could be more um, matches with his DNA to other cases? I, I Not have necessarily no. here. Yeah, but. I have no information about okay. that. I, I have no. Okay. And personally, how does it feel if any one of you guys could answer to be able to finally bring justice to families who have lost, you know, someone in such a horrific way? Uh, Any time you have a tragic crime like this where somebody loses somebody too soon, uh, getting the family answers is the most rewarding part of being involved in the case. I talked to her brother for about an hour uh, on Tuesday, and he was shocked. Um, couldn't quite process it yet, but to be able to talk to him for an hour and learn more about her and who she was as a person is what makes all the hard work worth it. And is this is her brother in America, or is he back in Iran? He's a, he's overseas. He's in London. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, Sergeant, when you were arrested, Mr. Christensen, what was did he say anything to you guys? What was his reaction? Was he kind of in shock? Was he was it kind of like you know that you know in a cookie jar kind of kind of little stuff thing? Or he, he didn't say anything. He didn't say a word. So not a lot to report there. Obviously, you don't know, you don't know the victim or anything, but can you maybe paint a picture for those of us who were born and you know, or what did your brother say? What was it about what a family doing or what she was like as a person or how he was looking these last 40 years? I don't know if I share that at this point. What about, what about the conversation with the brother? Like, what was, what, what, when, when you spoke to her brother over there in London, what was his, what was his, what was his reaction when you told him that you finally had something? Like I said, he was just kind of shocked by it all. I uh, hadn't been able to talk to him while we are looking at the case, so. Um, but it did, it, it did make it, it, to be able to inform the family of that made it worth all the hard work. Chief Deputy Thielen, you mentioned that, and I read in clips, that a lot of the focus was on the Middle Eastern community by law. There was some focus. I, I don't know if I characterize it as a lot, but there was some focus in that investigation that, in that direction. Well, the World Health reported that 100 uh, students of Middle Eastern descent were given their, taking their blood or, or hair samples at the time. And I know lots of different law enforcement agencies were involved at the time, Council Bluffs and Omaha. But do you feel that law enforcement um, should, should give a, an apology to that community um, in light of the arrest? I have. Now? Obviously, I was not involved in the investigation. I have no idea of how that part of it was handled. Um, I would assume that those investigators did what they thought was correct in that uh, circumstance. And again, remember, the technology that solved in this case was not available to those investigators. So they did what they did back in those days. They, they, you know, don't you? They went out and interviewed people and things like that. So that's how I would character. Do you know how many cold cases you guys have? Two that we're looking at currently. 
that you know may have some possibilities and stuff, but they're so different as far as evidence collection. I mean, I mean again, you guys look at your own business and how it's changed in 40 or 50 years, so you can imagine how it is for us to go back and look at stuff. So, but every case is open. We're out looking for them. So. I'm going to go ahead and conclude. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, again, uh, any uh, assistance from members of the public that might be watching this or reading uh, the articles uh, would be greatly appreciated. Thank you.